Welcome to Latter Day Digest. I'm going to turn it over to your host, Gene Judson and Summer Rain. Welcome, everybody, to Latter Daily Digest. Summer Rain is co hosting with me today, and we have Rick C. Bennett from Gospel Tangents on. How are you doing, Rick? And tell us about your story. Doing good. So I started uh, Gospel Tangents about nine years ago. Um, before that, I was kind of an anonymous blogger where I would talk about, you know, church history sort of thing. And then I thought, oh, I guess I won't be anonymous anymore. I'll, I'll start a new thing. And uh, so you I were just, in the, the blogosphere? I was, yeah. Oh, awesome. So, um, yeah. And I just, you know, I kept thinking. Because it seems like a lot of people, they'll start something, they'll do something for a few years, and then they'll be, like, tired of it, and they'll just stop. And I kept thinking that was going to happen, but it hasn't happened. <laughs> I'm just, just kept going. <laughs> so you, were, you mentioned to us before the show that you grew up in Ogden? Yeah, I grew up in Ogden. So, did so I you... went to both Ogden High and Bonneville, so I'm, I'm out of the split wow. loyalties there. But uh, And what was it like? From Bonneville, so that's the better school. <laughs> what was it like growing up? Did you have like callings in, you know, teach deacons, teachers, priests? Oh, yeah. So, well, let me back up even more because, um, so I grew up in Davis County for my first 11 years. And, uh, and then my dad moved us uh, from Utah to New Hampshire. And my dad was an East Coaster. He was from New Jersey. Um, he was with the Air, he was not in the Air Force, but he, he was adjacent with the Air Force. So he got a job at Hanscom Air Force Base in Massachusetts, and he called it Taxachusetts, and he didn't want to live in Massachusetts. And so we lived in New Hampshire. And so you, you can imagine, 11 years old, I still have a ticket that has Carl Yastrzemski on it. <laughs> wow. He got his 3,000th hit while I was there, you know, end of his wow. career. And uh, the Celtics were terrible. And then they drafted this guy named Larry Bird, which, you know, you've probably heard of him. And they went from yeah, worst to worst. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so a huge Celtics, Patriots, Red Sox, Bruins fan. And, uh, you know, the 2000s have been good for, for Boston sports teams, so. Yes, yes. Can't complain. I can complain for the previous 86 years for the Boston Red Sox. The 2000s have been good. I was there when, you know, I remember watching the, the ball go through Bill Buckner's legs. Oh, wow. And how, I remember how the ball long? with the Chicago Bears and, uh, oh, but, right. uh, it, you know, Tom Brady, Larry Bird. It's, it's how long were you in time. Massachusetts? So just four years, but, you know, they mm. were formative sports years. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So. So you got to see a game in Fenway. I will tell you this year, um, it was funny because my brother lives in New York, huge Red Sox fan. And um, so he, and he has like a 20 game package or something. So he had tickets to the Red Sox and we were driving and it's like a four hour drive, driving to Boston. And just as we get to Boston, his wife texts him and says, game's rained out. And so, oh. um, so we were planning on spending the night in Boston. We were gonna. It was a Saturday night game um, that we were supposed to go to. Um, they ended up having a double header on Sunday, Father's Day, and we wouldn't normally do that. But I was like, I really want to see the Red Sox play, and so we're there, Boston, and I was like, best Father's Day ever. <laughs> Baseball is like a good substitute for religion because you know the Bible starts off with in the big inning. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Gene. So, and they played the Yankees, and they swept a doubleheader. We only watched the first game because um, that's what our ticket was to, basically. But uh, And then we caught a flight home, and it, it was it, it was good. So it was great. It was, honestly, this was my best Father's Day ever this year was Red Sox. Red oh, Sox-Yankees. What, what? That's a big That's a big game. Yeah, so. that was awesome. So. All right. And so, so then you moved back to Ogden. So you, you were in Massachusetts as a deacon. So it was New Hampshire. Um, oh, New Hampshire, right. But uh, yeah, it was in the, well, it was in the Nashua stake. Well, it was first the Manchester stake and then the renamed it Nashua stake. And then they split. And I don't know what's happened. It's been a long time. All these years. But, uh, but yeah, so deacon, I was in the deacon's corner presidency, teacher's corner presidency. And then we moved back to Utah. So yeah. did while you were lived there, did you do some church history trips? No. 
You didn't go to Joseph no, Smith. No, I, I was all about Red Sox, Celtics, Patriots. <laughs> I'm telling you, if you see my journal from there, like on Sunday, it was like Rams 23, Steelers 7, <laughs> Dodgers 4, you know, Padres 1 or whatever. Like it's just, it's all sports scores. <laughs> And Pal- Palmyra didn't have an NFL team, so exactly you, go that you wouldn't be going there. Yeah, and I don't. <laughs> I don't think, well, how about how about Cooperstown then? No, I've never been to Cooperstown. I would love to go. I'm so one up on you. No, two up. I've been to Cooperstown twice. I have been to the Basketball Hall of Fame. That's in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, and mm-hmm. uh, I will tell you another funny game. Um, so BYU played Virginia in Springfield, Massachusetts. Ralph Sampson was the big center for Virginia. And I think Danny Ainge had just graduated, but they still had Fred Roberts and Greg Kite had some good players. And, um, and it was funny because we were on the top row of the Springfield Civic Center and Virginia was crushing. Devin Durant was on that team. No, it was before Devin Durant, way before. No, this was like the seventies. Oh, (laughs) It was like 79, 80, maybe it might've been 1980. Um, So anyway, um, Virginia opens up a big lead and then BYU starts fouling and Virginia starts missing, sh- missing free throws. And I know me and my brother were on the, and my dad were on the back row and we're yelling, you know, oh, miss, you, miss, miss. And, and, and we know that that was because of our yelling that, that Virginia missed and, and BYU came Ghost. back in. They the still Holy lost, but it was written. close. Exactly. Exactly. So. So that was a fun memory. <laughs> it's always I'm fun. I'm a Utah guy crowd. now, but that was a fun memory back then. Oh, yeah. When you, when oh, you can yeah. impact the game as a crowd, that's always fun. Yes. Exactly. The sixth man for basketball. <laughs> I don't think I've ever told that story before, but that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> you hear it first. <laughs> that's right. Oh, that's great. So you went so you, from the East Coast uh, to what Utah, right? You said yeah, you grew up yeah. mostly in in um the ogden area right um that's great and from there did you go where did you go to college and what was your kind of aspirations outside of being a baseball player so here's what's funny because well i did kind of tell you that i was a big byu fan back in the day Mm -hmm. and i'm a utah guy now and um so i went so i applied to byu and well during my senior year I was actually attending Weber State College. Oh, yeah, it was okay. Weber State College at the time. It changed to Weber State University while I was there. <laughs> <laughs> and so I actually graduated high school with a math minor, um, and I applied to BYU. And I and I guess I screwed up on my application because I wanted to get my transfer credits because I was really proud of that math minor because I'm a math nerd. <laughs> And so I did, I said I was a freshman, but I was a transfer student. And so they, they, they didn't give me a scholarship. And I was like, like so angry. I was so angry that I immediately applied to the University of Utah and I got a presidential scholarship and I got a presidential at Weaver. Wow. And then I wrote this nasty letter back to BYU and I was like, you guys screwed up. I got two presidents of <laughs> scholarship. Like, what is your problem? They and so... Out. So they called me on the phone and they're like, we're so sorry. Here's a t-shirt. We, we already gave away our presidential scholarships. We can give you an honor scholarship. And I'm like, that's a crappy scholarship. Like, I, I don't want that stupid so. thing. So screw you, BYU. And so that's that's why. You went to and, U of Well, no, I stayed at Weber because I was like, well, they're basically similar scholarships, but I could live at home and I could save a lot of money. And my parents didn't pay for my college. I had to pay for my own. So I was like, "Eh, Weber's the the way to go. So I got my bachelor's at Weber. And then... In in what subject? In math. Okay. Yeah, I I went with it. And, um, you know, and the idea was... Morton Thiokol, I don't know if you guys remember that. They were those solid rocket boosters that blew up the space shuttle. But anyway, they were a big company. Oh, <laughs> but they wow. worked most of the time. Yeah, they worked most of the time. But that one, that that one in 86, that was bad with the O-rings and everything. Okay, but, yep. um, okay. So they were a big uh, Contract. company. And I thought, you know what? I took an engineering class, one engineering class. And I got a C and I was like, I was working my tail off. I got an A in calculus. I got an A in chemistry and I worked my tail off for this stupid C. 
And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to be an engineer, but I'm going to do it the math route because I'm good at math. And I don't... But anyway, that's not what happened. I ended up taking a stats class and I really like statistics. And I was like, this is cool. And so um, after I graduated from Weber, I actually applied for the biostatistics program at Utah. And uh, in fact, they're one of the few they're the only one in Utah that has a biostats program. And I would, I'd worked like going through high school and college, I'd worked at a hospital and I kind of enjoyed the healthcare industry mm -hmm. and I'm a good math guy. And I was like, Oh, biostatistics, like this is my thing. Um, I didn't get, so the weird thing was at Utah, they were like, Oh, you'll get in. There's only four people apply. Like it's a small program. You'll get in. Well, that year, of course, 20 people applied. <laughs> Oh, wow. And then the next year, 20 more people applied. And I was like, oh, what the heck? So I waited 15 years. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and then I applied a third time. And finally, like four people applied. And I got it. <laughs> you got it. And so, wow. uh, yeah, so I got my master's from the University of Utah. So in, in, in bio, bio, bio statistics. Stat? Yeah. So medical did, statistics, basically. What did you want to do with that? So I wanted to be a medical statistician, an epidemiologist, a, you know, kind of a Dr. Fauci kind of a guy, except for I'm not a, not a medical guy, but, uh, you know, right. do, you, you do Run a hospital someday. Those sort of things. So I did my first job out of, out of college, out of my master's degree college. Um, I worked for a medical research company and we worked on traumatic brain injuries and spinal cord injuries. Wow. And so, um, so that was pretty, really interesting. It was a lot of fun. So. I grew but up. Now watching, I teach. I'm a, I'm a I grew up watching the Six TV. Million Dollar Man, so I didn't think I needed to take care of my body. I just thought <laughs> you just go online and order body parts, and it would just like <laughs> happen. But so we anyway. can rebuild him. Yeah, He'll be faster, stronger, better. I used to watch that show too. <laughs> yeah. That was a great yeah. show. And Wonder Woman. Yes. <laughs> With Linda Carter. Yes. And so. so we're so showing you started, our age, Gene. We got to stop this. You started. That's right. We do. We'll do another episode on seventies um, TV yes. shows. <laughs> and so, so let's see. So, what other church callings did you have as an adult, or when did you get married, or tell us all those things? So it is funny. Um, so the ward I grew up in, Ogden. You know, they talk about the newlyweds and nearly deads. Oh, Mine was just a, a, a nearly dead's worth. Wow. <laughs> like we had these condo, we called them the condos and everybody was over 70 years old. And so we had very few young people in our ward. And um, so when I was 18, believe it or not, um, well, it was funny because I was working at the hospital and um, I, I was working in order to get the the hospital would pay half my tuition because I did lose that scholarship eventually. It took way too many hard math classes, but <laughs> they would pay half my tuition if I worked 24 hours a week. And so I started working a ton of weekends and my mom was like, she was getting on my case, like, oh, you need to go to church, you know? And, and I had a friend, I remember one time <laughs> and he's like, hey, if you work a double shift for me on Saturday, I will work a double shift for you on Sunday. Oh. And I was like, oh, well, maybe I should get my mom off my case and I'll go to church one time. Well, it's weird because, you know, I'd been active up until like the last probably six months before this happened. Um, and my excuse was, well, I got to work, you know, it's not that I, you know, I haven't lost my testimony. I just have to work, got to pay yeah. for school. And so I remember walking into the gym where the priest had met and um, the member of the second counselor in the state presidency was in our ward. So I wasn't really surprised to see him, but I remember when I walked in a little bit late and he turns and he sees me and he starts walking towards me. And I was like, that's kind of weird. <laughs> and so he pulled it. Can I talk to you for a minute? Okay. We'd like you to be the elders quorum second counselor. And I was like, what? I'm freaking 18. Wow. Like, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> This is not like a college ward. This is like, like I said, they didn't have, like, at the time, yeah. they were like, 
high priest. Oh. We had like 50 high priests. And we had once like, you hit 40, you became a high priest back then. Yeah. So they were all. And we had like 12 <sighs> elders. And so the discolonial elders, quorum president, and he was like, I mean, didn't have a lot of choices. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> oh my word. And I remember thinking, I remember they pulled me in and, they, and I'm like, so what does a second counselor do? Well, you need to talk about home teaching. And I'm like, I've never been a home teacher before other than, you know, hanging out with my dad. Wow. Like, am I in charge? And they put me with a 16 year old priest. And I was like, what, what the is heck? Going like, I've never done this before. <laughs> anyway, it was really weird. Right. And now you're a trainer. So, well, and I told my state president, or he was the second counselor, and I said, but I work on Sunday. And he just said, well, see what you can do about that. Wow. <laughs> like, oh, oh no pressure. No yeah, pressure. Exactly. Just... And so I, it was funny because there was this guy that had worked at the hospital forever. And I, and I never expected him to quit. And he quit. And he was working nights. And so I could get off the weekends. And I started working nights. And so, wow. yeah. So the year and a half before my mission... I was a I was a counselor in the elder school in Princeton. Wow. In fact, wow. my parents, when I was on my mission for six months, they finally released me. <laughs> they were like, "Hey, they released no. you in church today," and I was <laughs> like, "I've been on my mission for six months." <laughs> it was the weirdest thing, but I mean, so, it kind of tells you how desperate they were for you know just a a younger so as a, right as a counselor. Every three weeks, you're like starting the class, asking people to say prayers and in charge, right? You do a rotation of who's presiding that day, right? Yeah, but there was only like three people who showed up to Elder's Quorum. So it wasn't like, you know, it was like, I don't know, it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't, but did that It was like, like the way... presidency and like one or two other people. That was it. Like that was our meeting because we just during didn't have your, any elders. During your mission, did you think that that tr trained you a little bit to be like more mature or anything on your mission? Well, you know, and I've, I've kind of said this before, um, you know, BYU has this reputation as the Lord's University, and and I would always say, well, for me, Weber was the Lord's University, because I would have never, I don't think, I would have never had this opportunity if I'd have gone to BYU, right. um, or even Utah, I don't think. It, it was one of those really unique situations, and so it was really, it was a good experience for me. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually in two Elder Scorum presidencies before my mission because the one guy moved, and so they had to get another one. And they're like, "Well, Rick's been serving, and we need him, so we'll just keep him." That is so <laughs> incredible to me. And where where were you called? Where did you serve your mission? South Carolina. South Carolina. Yeah, wow. South Carolina and Georgia. I spent beginning and the end in Georgia, but yeah, so the South Carolina mission. So that's so incredible to have such big callings. Um, yeah, in Utah, going, of all places. in Utah, before going on your mission. I mean, it's, yeah. it's pretty incredible. So you go on your mission, and then when you got back, is that um, is that when you went, met your wife? Was it right when you came back, or or did she uh, wait for you? It was it was a ten year struggle to find her. <laughs> but it was worth it. It was it worth was it. worth it. But it was a long time. Is, is it because yeah, you no, have I, so high standards, or because women didn't really take a liking to you? Or just probably no, the latter. Was, there. No, it was it was the or Lord's could plan, be, Gene. It was the Lord's plan. It was for so me. <laughs> like I was, you know very mature before i kissed a girl you know in a way me know, like too I, me like, too. I, I didn't kiss a girl until after high school i don't think you know so so anyhow <laughs> so a 10-year search for your wife so that means you're all done with school so yeah i was kind of one of those guys i was like oh i'm not gonna get married till i'm 24 or 25 and so like school was a was a big focus for me. I really wanted to graduate. I really wanted to get out on my own. And I remember when I turned 24 or 25, I was like, I know I said I was supposed to get married now, but I don't, I still don't feel ready. <laughs> That's right. And so your so, mom pressured you to, um, go oh, to yeah. church when you're 18. Did she pressure you to get married when you were 28? You know, they were pretty good about that. Um, it was funny because my dad, Anytime I would go out on a date, like there was always something wrong with the girl, and they were crossing their fingers. Wow. Basically, I think he wanted me to get to graduate from college before I ever started dating. Um, and so then it was like the day I graduated, 
then he was like, every girl was great. Like, you should marry her. She's great. And I was like, yeah, I don't really like her that way, Dad. But when yeah. I, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I was just, I was a late bloomer. I will just say that. And uh, um, so I got so married in my 30s. So and, and you were into your career. What was your, what, what kind of job did you have by the time yeah, you got Yeah, so I graduated. Um, I had taken a statistics class. And um, so I was still working at the hospital. I was, I was an EKG tech, and um, one of the nurses I worked with, she said, hey, my husband's hiring at this vitamin company, and you know statistics. And I was like, yeah. And so it was really kind of one of those cool things. Her name was Marlisa, and then her husband was Jeff. And it was funny because I knew Marlisa better than Jeff, and then after I got the job, like, I never saw Marlisa again, and I just hung out with Jeff. <laughs> And so my first job was doing statistics for, uh, it was quality control for a vitamin company in Ogden. And then um, then the company got bought out and they eliminated my position and I did production for a year, which was awful. And then um, some of the guys remembered that I was pretty good with computers. And so then I became a network administrator and kind of the, the help desk for this, it was a small company. Um, that's now a large company, multinational company. And so um, so I did a lot of computer tech support and that sort of a thing for a long time. Um, and so then, you know, my wife met me. I had this, I was a great, I was a computer guy, you know, I was stable, everything. And then Future a year after I got married, lose my job again. No. <laughs> oh, no. And so, and, and then I decided... I didn't want to do computers anymore because, well, one of the problems was because we were we were now multinational and I used to get these phone calls at 3 a.m. from this guy in London, which it wasn't 3 a.m. in London. I get it. And he's like, I can't print. And I'm like, I don't care at three in the morning. <laughs> he's like, but I really need to print. And I'm like, oh. And so I was on call. It was like the oh reason I didn't word. go into medicine was because I didn't want to be on call. And I was on right. call. And I hated this. And so so I kind of started a wedding video business for a while, which just as I was starting to get up where I was like, oh, people were starting to call me and everything. And then my wife said, you know what? I want to move to Utah County. I don't like, you know, she's from Utah County. She's a Utah County girl. And I thought, oh, well, I can do a wedding video business anywhere. And in Utah yeah. County, everybody's like, oh, my brother does video editing. You know, like it killed my business. Oh, man. <laughs> and so um, so then I got a job at Walmart as a manager. Um, I told you that production job, that one year I spent in production was terrible. That Walmart job was horrendous. Oh, my God. Because <laughs> they put me on the overnight shift. Oh man. It was awful. Anyway, I almost got divorced. It was terrible. It was horrible. Oh man. My brother died during that time also. Oh, that, didn't, that didn't shoot. help. And then um and then my wife was like, you know, you always wanted to get that master's degree. Why not? And you like teaching. And I've been teaching at Salt Lake Community College with just a bachelor's degree, believe it or not. Um, but they told me they wouldn't hire me without a master's degree. And so mm -hmm. I was like teaching oh. math classes. Yeah. So I remember <laughs> it was the funniest thing. And I also freelance. Um, and there was a, a major network, I will just say, that uh, had the Rocky Mountain Review at Salt Lake Community College. And I remember walking in there and I was like, well, I'd worked at a place called Stevens Henniger, which was a horrible place to work. But I was like, I could work at Salt Lake Community College. And so I interviewed with the math department and the computer department. And the computer department hired me on the spot to do computer networking. And wow. the problem was, well, they gave me a class, but my Stevens Henniger job, I couldn't, I, the schedules didn't work and I couldn't, so I had to say no. And the math department interviewed me and they were like, well, without a master's degree, we really can't hire you. And then two months later, they were like, we're desperate. Will you teach this class? <laughs> Just kidding. And so, so I started teaching the math department, which I love. I love that. Um, and this is with, with just a bachelor's. With this, just this, a bachelor's. Yeah. 
And so I kind of got grandfathered in and I, and I kept teaching for a long time, but I always wow. and I knew that in order to get a full-time job, I You'd had to get to. a master's degree. And so, so I was kind of working at Salt Lake Community College, kind of working at Walmart. I hated Walmart. It was so bad. I mean, the pay was fine, but it was just awful hours. And I mean, they expected you when you interviewed. Well, it's kind of funny because <laughs> when they interviewed, they said, we expect you to work 48 hours a week. Wow. Like if you don't want to do that, this job is not for you. And so that was just, that was your expected normal working hours. And so the funny thing after I quit, um, I got paid all this money for unpaid overtime from a class action lawsuit, right? which was really wow. nice because now I had no job and I was going to school and my wife was kind of supporting us. And, and you had this baby. nice little, you know. <laughs> Windfall. Yeah, we had a baby and we were so poor. Wow. And I remember I remember thinking, you know, I, I'm going to get married when I'm gonna 30. I'm going to be healthy. I'm going to have a family. I'm not, or I'm not going to go to school when I'm, a, when I have a young family. And that's exactly what happened. It was just delayed, you know, it was 15 years between my bachelor's and my master's degree. <laughs> wow. Wow. And wow. So, wow. Anyway, I got my master's degree and I did not know. So for those of you who are thinking of a career in academia, because generally at a junior college or a community college, uh, you only need a master's degree. If you want to work at a four-year college, you need a PhD. Mm hmm and my master's degree was hard. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. And so I was like, ain't no way I'm doing a PhD in this. This sucks. Um, <laughs> but there was a job, there were three jobs at Salt Lake Community College. And I was in, the, there were there were five finalists. And I finished in the bottom two. And I was just like, are you kidding me? And I worked there. Like I had worked there for at least five years. And so oh, it's just so academia can be tough. Um, so anyway, then I, uh, but now that I had a master's degree, it opened up a lot of doors. I started teaching at Utah Valley. And so that's where I teach now. And uh, uh, I taught at some other online school, uh, Western governors and things like that. And so, so anyway, I will just say, it, it, you know, I did get a job at Western Governors, but I, it was like more of a math tutor than a math teacher. Because mm -hmm. um, once again, they want a PhD because they're a four-year college. And I was just like, I don't want to get a PhD. <laughs> and that's that's so interesting because so, it's something that you actually enjoy. Yeah. Um, so imagine if you don't enjoy it, how difficult that master's would have been in the PhD because you actually like that. So, yeah. um, well, I, I love teaching. I, it's great. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. The nice thing at UVU was they didn't have enough PhDs to teach the statistics classes. And so I got them. And then they hired a PhD. And so now I don't get to teach the stuff. You're back to low man. Anyway. Yeah. So, when did you start becoming interested in church history? So, I got married in the year 2000. And um, I remember it was, I think, was my wife pregnant? I think it was 2002. We, um, my sister said, Hey, let's go for the Nauvoo temple open house. And so we went, so we did that. And it was one of the, the first family trips. So my parents came, my sister came, like it was, we don't do that, especially, I mean, we did that as kids, but we don't do that as adults. Yeah. And, um, and so I remember on going location there. for the Hosanna shout. Yeah. And I didn't know. No, 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 no. Not for the dedication, just for the open house. Oh, open house. Right. Okay. But uh, so, and I remember being surprised that the Joseph Smith home was owned by the community of Christ. Okay. What's this all about? Like, I didn't know. Why do they own that? Like, <laughs> we should no. have that. Right? Exactly. That's yeah. our, that's our property. What are they yeah. doing? About? And they <laughs> owned. uh they owned like the Joseph Smith house, the mansion house. And I was like, and the brick, the red brick store. And, and I remember just being like, this is weird, you know? Yeah. And then my, I had an Institute teacher at Weaver state and he was also my Bishop that had written a book on. And I think the subtitle was what happened to the family of Joseph Smith. And my mom was like, Hey, Bishop Johansson wrote this book. And, and so then I was like, I just, 
I just loved the church history that I learned in Nauvoo. So that was about 2002. And because I didn't know, like, why don't we own the mansion house? Why don't we own the Joseph Smith house? Yeah. And, and what happened to the family of Joseph Smith? I had no idea because we don't talk about that in the LDS church. And the RLDS church, they know that. Like, yeah. Well, that's our church. You know, they that's know their that. church history. And so it was really fun to learn that. And that was really kind of what sparked my interest was that well, that one trip. And, uh, and then, so it was 2006 when I went to get my master's degree. And so I, I quit my job at Walmart. Um, and I, I was a manager there, by the way. So it wasn't like I was stuck. Well, I was stocking shelves, but I was a manager. <laughs> I could tell you some crazy stories about the Walmart overnight shift, but anyway, um, <laughs> so I, I had this time. I got a I got an iPod. And I I found this podcast. I don't know if you've heard of it, Mormon Stories, <laughs> and they were talking about church history, and I was like, wow, didn't know anything. Like I learned so much from that podcast, and um, and so then you know, fast forward a decade. John gets axed and the tone of his podcast really changed. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like, cause it, I felt like John at the beginning, at least for the, until he got excommunicated, did a really good job of trying to stay neutral. I don't think he, right. and, and he and doesn't he pretend stay to be Mormon. Neutral anymore. Yeah. And, and so I thought, you know what, I want to, I want to fill that space that John vacated of mm -hmm. being a neutral, just being neutral this is what happened. I'm not pro-Mormon. I'm not anti-Mormon. I just want to be, you know, Walter Cronkite. And that's the way it is, you know. January 10th, 2024. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so, um, so that so I felt like John gave that opening to me, and I was like, I'm gonna take it. So, so I felt I feel like you know I, I want to be that neutral guy, that neutral voice. You know, we can talk about tough things like mountain meadows and polygamy, and you know. Did you, have, that, um, uh, without a fighting. Of, did you have a piece of paper you started thinking of all the different names that you can have for your podcast and then you you finally stuck on Gospel Tangents or did, was that like always what you wanted? Okay, so where the name Gospel Tangents came from, um, that's a good story. So back when I was in college at Weber State, <laughs> uh, I had a couple of buddies and uh, I think it was after institute class or something and there was a debate on whether Adam had a belly button or not. I don't know if you've ever had that debate. Have you had, have you heard that? Did Adam no. have a belly button? No. Uh, you know, you know? We are. It's a good, it's a good philosophical question. I've just. Yeah. And I have no thought. idea. I, I yeah. Our class had actual did. photos of Adam's. I, I'm guessing he probably did. But I don't know. And so anyway, so we're, we're debating this, which I didn't know at the time was kind of like an Adam God doctrine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, like it's, it's a very interesting, it sounds you know? like an innocent question, but it yeah. can get kind of deep. Yeah. And so one of my buddies goes, you know, cause we're talking about this and they're like, Oh, this is the gospel tangents class. <laughs> I was like, that is the best name. <laughs> yes. I love that. And so that always stuck in my head, the gospel. Yeah. Tangents that's pretty class. awesome. And so like, and that, and so that was that was probably in the nineties, eighties, maybe. And so I, so I you, just always you, remembered that day, but I was like, I'm going to use that name. That's my name. <laughs> so you're, get, you're getting ready. You, you have, you, you buy equipment and, and you're going to have your first show. What, who's your first show? Or what's my your first, first show about? My first one was with Margaret Young. I don't know if you know her. She's a adjunct at BYU. She teaches English. I knew she was a big I knew she was super nice, number one. I knew she knew about Jane Manning James. Um, I'd heard her being interviewed by John DeLynn. And I was pretty sure she was going to say yes. <laughs> That's why I picked her. <laughs> and so, yeah, so we talked about the life of Jane Manning James. Um, and, and then my second interview was my biggest coup. And I was so nervous because I interviewed Paul Reeve. So I'm a big, one of my favorite topics is blacks in the priesthood. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it, you know, I went to my, on my mission to South Carolina and Georgia. And so we taught a lot of black people 
And I remember when the 1978 revelation came out. So I was living in New Hampshire at the time. I was probably about 11 years old or so. And um, I didn't know any black people. And so when they announced that black people could be ordained and I was like, black people couldn't be ordained before now. I didn't know that. <laughs> like I, I had no idea. Yeah. I had no clue. Like, yeah. you know, I'm just a little kid. And I was just like when really Summer like, was uh, six, she thought she was going to pass a sacrament someday. Oh, really? <laughs> Not really. But Jean likes to imagine what I was like when I was six. So, <laughs> no, Dad, it's my turn. Yeah. So go ahead. Sorry. So, so you, I uh, just, I always thought it was really strange. Like, why couldn't black people be ordained? Like, that always bugged me my whole life. That always bugged me. Like, that's just weird. I don't. And it wasn't it really ever me. explained, right? So no. Like, well, it we still hear... hasn't been explained. Right. <laughs> because so... by 1978, it had been 20 years almost since the civil rights movement. That was all just way in the back history, you know, yeah. of America. And, and all of a sudden in 1978, the, the blacks are getting the priesthood. So that's, yeah. that would be a... And I just remember being so surprised. Like, why couldn't they get the priesthood before? Like, that's weird. Like, right. I don't know. It, may, it always bothered me. It always it never made any sense to me. And I went on my mission to South Carolina and Georgia, and I was just praying that no black people would say, so why wouldn't we hold the church? And luckily for me, nobody asked me. Because no asked... wow. <laughs> I don't know what I would have said. Yeah. <laughs> I, wow. I have no idea what I would have said. Um, and I have some dear friends that are black and uh um and so I, i've always been very like please don't ask me about this because i don't know what i would yeah. say and they never did and i never brought it up <laughs> and so that, but it's always that was, bugged me and so that's why paul reeve so paul reeve uh, you know he he and then so the the scoop on that was because i had heard rumors that he had written the race and priesthood essay and yeah. so, um, heard so if, if you go back and listen to that interview, not only is the audio bad, but <laughs> you can tell in my voice, like, I am so nervous to ask right. this question. So Paul, <laughs> I, I remember because I'm like, I'm like being around the bush. Like, this is kind of a touchy question. I don't know if you can, because I totally expected him to dodge. Yeah. I was like, did, did you have anything to do with the race essay? He's like, yeah. I was wow. like, tell me more. <laughs> and so I it's remember... neither secret nor sacred. That he <laughs> well, he was like, well, they body. never told me I couldn't talk about it. So I'll, right. I'll talk about it. And so it was like my first scoop, my second yeah. interview ever. And now, I remember I, because I, the month of February, I had 200 downloads. And that one episode, I got 600. <laughs> right. so that's 2017? So uh. I think it was, yeah, 2016, maybe. Did you, yeah. were you able to learn some things, uh, you know, aside from what was in the essay when you spoke to Paul one-on-one -on -one about that? Well, yeah, because, you know, his book, The so I here, I'll give you guys a hint on how to book authors. If they have a new book out, they usually say yes. <laughs> There Not we go. always, but that's a good way. Like, tell, yeah. tell me about your book. And so right. that was how I, that was my angle was because Paul had his book, Religion of a Different Color. And uh, so I said, hey, let's talk about your book. And I, then I threw in, you know, and by the way, <laughs> did you write that essay? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so because he was talking about. This was the weirdest thing to me. Like our conceptions of race are so, they, they've changed so much since the 19th century. So yeah. if you became a Mormon, there was a Mormon race. There was an Irish race. There was an Italian race. <laughs> um, like they would talk about that. And so, especially with Mormons, they, so they had this thing called, I think it's called physiognomy where they would like touch your head and they would be like, oh yeah, clearly oh, you're a Mormon is it, because is it your phrenology head feels no. that way. Well, for not, there was phrenology and physiognomy. I think there were two oh, like oh, right. pseudosciences. You know, wow. they would look at your eyes. Oh, you've got beady eyes, you're a Mormon. <laughs> you know, like they would just make up this weird stuff and and that your blood would actually change when you became a Mormon. And so there was, an, so Mormons were a new race 
Um, and so Paul talks about that in his book. And I just remember being like, I mean, it's such a weird, they, they found it so weird in the 19th century. <laughs> they were practicing so science at the time. They were trying to, yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway, so that was that was the weirdest thing was was physiognomy and what was the word you said, Gene? Phrenology. Phrenology. Yeah, those were the two. That's like lumps names. on your head. Yeah, that's what it was. I, I'm I get them mixed up, but yeah. So um, anyway, I, and even you know Brigham Young thought there was like a Asian race or an Asian Adam and Eve and a black Adam and Eve and a white Adam and Eve and an Irish Adam and Eve and a <laughs> you know, I Italian did not know Adam that. Yeah, I, it's I, called. That, that came from my interview, if you want to go back, with the bad audio. <laughs> I didn't know. I will tell you what, because I it was it was only it's only in one ear. Uh-huh. Now I know how to fix that. But at the time I had so if you go back and listen to those audios, it's only in one ear because I didn't know. You know, when you're new, you don't know how to fix stuff. <laughs> That's amazing. But, yeah. Well, we'll we'll actually, Gene, we'll link that just so people can go back to this because I it sounds like this interview was Amazing. I've redone it. I should let you do the full interview, the full two hour interview where it's in both ears. Because <laughs> I fixed it. But the original episode, it's only in one ear, and I didn't know. Wow. How to fix it. So, but yeah, so because apparently Brigham Young believed that, but they, he calls it polygenesis I've never heard theory. That. It's an Asian Adam and Eve, and a black wow. Adam and Eve, and a white Adam and Eve, and a, you know, like I, to me, Irish, Irish people weren't considered white, Italian people weren't yes. white. Yes, I, I actually, like, I actually what? did know that. It wasn't until our our recent interview with um, RFM that he said when he was going to law school that the whole our Mormons are race thing was, I guess, resurfacing. Yeah, he, and he, he put, put it on put his application Mormon, to BYU. Yeah, on his law or, application or to Texas to Texas. Yeah, he put Mormon as his race, and he said he thinks that th- that, that had a little part in him getting accepted <laughs> because oh, he put weird. that in. But I never, um, the, I mean, I just, I love affirmative action because you, you hear, <laughs> yeah, an affirmative action, I was telling him, but um, you hear these things that you've never heard before, even though it, it's part of your culture, you, you think you've heard it all, and then um, you talk to one person, it just opens your eyes to a whole new um, history that you never heard of before. So that's amazing yeah. to hear that. Yeah, that was a fun interview. So it was my first viral moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so you kind of just... How long did um, it take? Oh, oh go, go ahead, Gene. Oh, how long did it take to get 1,000 subscribers? You remember? So here's the weird thing. I remember youtube back in the day if you got a hundred subscribers then you were eligible for advertising and wow. so that happened you know within a couple of months and so so i got the advertising and then after for like a month or two then they changed it to a thousand and so then they took it away and i'm like you can't take that away like that's crap wow. and so then i was like come on everybody i gotta get a thousand <laughs> so, yeah. I know, remember listening funny. to one of your interviews that said, we're almost to a thousand. So if everybody can, you know, ask your friend. Yeah, you and- probably know the answer better than I do, but I think it was within the first year. I think I got a thousand, but I don't, I don't remember exactly how long, but I remember it felt like it took forever, especially because you had you it. Know, I, I made like 10 cents or whatever on that. <laughs> right. That's the other thing is like, it's not like you make a lot of money on these things, but, but it's something. Yeah, it's something and to so, shoot for. Yeah, it was probably nine months or so to like get a thousand. I don't, I don't know. I I logged into YouTube a little bit ago, and there was some sort of hooray! You have three hundred subscribers. Yeah, yeah. It didn't have like a trophy icon or anything. It was just like a poster. Like, oh, you'll you get know, those when you get a thousand. You get a trophy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so that's that's fun. Um. Who have been some good interviews the last couple of years? So I will tell you this other funny one. Um, when I interviewed Elder Snow, he at the time, historian, well, he knew he was going. He was the church historian. He was a seventy. Um, he knew he was going to be released in October. It took me over a year to get him. By the way, 
Um, and then when I got them, I was like, I am not waiting. Like I'm putting this, I'm taking this one out. And so uh, I remember going to Sunstone and I had just, I was releasing it. You know, how I release it every couple of days or something. And um, I was talking to Benchmark Books. They used to buy, you can see here, some of my transcripts like this one. I still make these. I'm behind on them really bad though. Um, and Kurt Bench had said, hey, because I, I, he was selling them. He's like, do you have any of those? I'll buy them from you and then I'll, I'll sell them here at Sunstone. And I was like, oh, I've got like one or two because I don't, you know, I don't. I sell them on Amazon, you know, right. I, don't, I don't, I don't keep them here. So I was like, right. here, I'll give you the one or two that I have and I'll just get another one. And um, so the next day I came in, I, I go, I hand them to Kurt Bench um, so he can sell them. And this person next to me takes out his AirPods and goes, I'm listening to that Elder Snow interview right now. It's awesome. No way. <laughs> Wow. Like, yeah. So that was my probably my second viral moment was yeah. uh, was getting You're like him. I'm kind of a celebrity. <laughs> is listening to me right now. That is so cool, so, Rick. That, that was pretty fun. Be, that was awesome. a pretty surreal experience there. Yeah, you well, know? and it, it is cool, you know, because I'll go to like MHA or Sunstone or um uh, what's it uh, Whitmer. And, yeah. you know, you'll have these people like, oh, I li well, I had this one guy, I think he lives in Alabama, and we went to lunch, and he's like, this is so wild, like, you're in my head every morning on my walk, and now I'm eating lunch with you, and I'm like, I try. I'm just me, you know, like, <laughs> I'm like I eat lunch too, you know. <laughs> well, I eat lunch too. <laughs> You're, you're so, now a celebrity when somebody's glad to eat lunch. No, I I'm not a cueless celebrity. I have a, yeah. <laughs> hey, you guys. It turns out that I was way too talkative with uh, Summer and Jean. So we're going to have another conversation, part two, with me, Rick Bennett. So check that out.